Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Decameron Project's third virtual event. This afternoon, we're excited to be hosting Ben Moser, acclaimed biographer and winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize in that field. Ben's work really stands out as a testament as to not only the cultural importance of biography, but also the immense artistry and creative skill that can be invested into nonfiction writing. Today, Ben has published two biographies, one of Clarice Lispector and one of Susan Sontag, both influential female intellectuals with enormous cultural strength. Ben's work has often led him to fully submerge himself in other cultures, often learning new languages on the fly, and we're honored to have the privilege of hosting him here today. Just a few logistical things before we get started. This event's planned to be roughly 40 minutes interview and 20 minutes Q&A. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions early, and for everyone else here in attendance, we'll be opening Zoom's Q&A function in a couple of minutes before the audience questions begin. So do keep your questions in mind. And so without further ado, I'm pleased to propose it to our virtual event, as well as my friend and colleague Wardy, who will be conducting the interview alongside myself. Hey, Alex. Hey, Ben. Can everyone hear, uh, everyone hear each other properly? Yes. It's really amazing to have you here with us today. I think the way for us to start off would be to tell us a bit about well, biography. So I just published in 2019 a book of, about Susan Sontag that I worked on for seven years. Um, and that was actually an outgrowth of my previous biography, which was about the Brazilian writer Clarice Lispector, which I published in 2009. Um, and actually the Susan came out of the Clarice biography because I got asked by Sontag's um, son and her agent and her publisher if I would do this one too. And I actually hadn't planned to do another biography, okay. but it's hard to say no to Susan Sontag. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so yeah, so one came out of the, another. And, um, and now I really think I'm not gonna do another one. I'm gonna try to do something else. Um, yeah, so I think it's really interesting that you um, are so interested in writing biographies and obviously have written two very successful biographies at that. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, of, um, about why you're interested in writing biographies and how you became interested in this uh, specific kind of writing and uh, what the process is like for when you uh, were researching these two women and deciding to write about them. Well, so the first biography called Why This World about Clarice Spector was something that I had kind of fantasized about since I was in college, actually, because I encountered this writer and I was completely obsessed with her and I had no idea like how to convey my obsession with her because I mean, she had been sort of haphazardly translated here and there, but um, I just thought maybe that was the way to bring her into English was through a biography. It was a way to kind of tell her story and hope that she would then, you know, her interestingness would be obvious to people even though they couldn't really read her writing. Um, so that's what happened. I mean, that that actually was a big gamble uh, that I took when I was in my early twenties. Then, um, I mean, I guess you asked me about the process of writing them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, biography, so biography is a really tough genre in some ways because it's so many people involved. I mean, unless you're writing about somebody who's been dead for 800 years. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. sort of sometimes the ideal in some ways, but you know, you have their, your, their family, their friends, their ex-girlfriend, their whatever, like all their kids, everybody has a part of a biography. And um, that's actually, that can be tough, but it's also really fun. So a lot of my process is getting to know those people. I mean, that's the first thing. You have to know who's who and almost the chronology, you know, like who was she dating in, you know, when she was 24. And then you go find that person. If the person's dead, you find that person's daughter or you find, and then you kind of start constructing a, kind of network almost because one thing you learn is that people actually don't know that many people I mean because with Facebook and all that like you think people know 5,000 people but like they usually don't like most people have you know they have their family and then they have their friends and it's usually like 100 people or something not okay. really more than that so the process is going around and trying to contact you know whichever 100 is still alive or their relatives and, and going from there right yeah, and I mean, contacting them is the first thing, and then you actually, you really build a relationship with them. 
I mean, that's the thing that makes biography very social and it's really fun if you're interested in like if you like meeting people and traveling and all the kinds of things that I used to like to do before we stopped doing those things. <laughs> yeah. uh, like you get to get out in the world a lot. And, um, and then you get to know, I mean, you start to trust your feelings about people too. And like a lot of times with really famous people, you realize that a lot of the people you can't really always trust. Right. Like they want, like they're actually like one paragraph in the book and they're trying to get like a whole chapter. Right. about themselves like you know so you get you kind of develop this as a, a feeling for them um and then you know you get into the archives um if it's a literary i'm talking about a literary biography which is sort of different from if i were writing a biography of like a politician or mm -hmm. like a musician i've been approached to write a biography of a musician i said like, well i don't know that i mean i like music but i don't really know i mean writers write stuff so you find their diaries you find their articles they wrote you find and then you can create it through that yeah. um, musicians don't do that for example um mm. i was talking to a friend today who's doing a buyer who's angela merkel for example right and um like angela merkel doesn't even email good lord wow. not to mention yeah. that she's still alive so it's you know you might have well, to and she's the chancellor that. of germany so if she doesn't like you you know she's got some leverage um <laughs> But it's very hard to get into, and you know, and then you're writing, there's a big difference between writing about someone who's alive and someone who's dead. Yeah. Um, I don't think I would want to write about somebody alive. I think it's, um, I think lives tend to have a shape that become, becomes clear once the person's no longer there. Right on. So I guess a question that follows quite naturally then is, you know, obviously there are immense pressures if you're writing about someone that's alive, but I think even, you know, someone who's dead to some extent that still really exists. In getting to meet all of these people, you know, Sontag's friends or Clarice's family, did you ever feel, you know, how did you resist pressures of people to tell the story a certain way and, you know, maintain your independence as a writer without obviously, you know, having no one to go to and no one to turn to because they're not going to like what you read? Well, so in my first biography, I was really careful to be nice to everybody. Right. Because I thought, oh, golly, gee, you know, I felt sort of humble and sort of whatever. Um, and then from the reactions to it, I realized that, I mean, it's not, I didn't really have negative reactions, but people would get offended by stuff that I just never would have thought they would have been offended by. Like yeah. I was pretty careful. Oh yeah, like somebody got really offended by my description of his mother's clothes in like 1956 or something. And it wasn't even me, it was like, some, I was just quoting some letter or something, um, completely harmless. You know, so you realize that people have a lot of stake in these things. Like, they really, really care. You realize that, like, books are really powerful because people, people care very, very deeply about how they're portrayed. And so you don't really know where those bodies are going to be buried. Right. You don't really have that capacity to judge it. So actually, for my second um, biography, I felt a lot freer because I thought, well, people are going to react however they're going to react. So what I have to do is be true to my impressions um, and my research and my instincts about things. Fair enough. Yeah. So something that I'm curious about is how and why did you choose to write about Clarice Lispector and Susan Sontag specifically? And did you ever consider about writing about somebody else besides those women? Um, well, so Clarice was my big love in college. So I discovered her, we were saying, I, I took Portuguese in college sort of by accident and I fell into it because I had sort of not failed out of Chinese, but kind of failed out of Chinese. Like it was not my thing and I realized it pretty quickly and I needed to take a language. So I took Portuguese and, um, and that was really funny in a way. Like it was really um, something I never really thought about. And I met, I mean, I didn't meet her, she was dead, but. I discovered this author and I just had this missionary sense of like, I'm going to be the one that's going to make her the person she deserves to be, which is, you know, one of the most important modern writers. Um, so I chose her and then, um, and then Susan, you know, came out of that because um, what they said to me when they asked me to do Susan was that um, they wanted somebody who could take on the life of a, of an intellectual woman with an international background, you know? Um, so that's why, you know, it was important to know languages and it was important to have, um, 
Well, I guess certain social and professional contacts that would have been similar to Susan's world. Um, so, you know, knowing people in different places and, and knowing the literary world and the world of journalism and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it's a big challenge and it's a big honor to be asked to do that. I mean, especially because I'm an American who's lived abroad for most of my life now. Um, for me, it was kind of a return to America and to American culture. Well, quite a return it was, I gotta say. But um, I, suppose a, I suppose a question that stems, like, well, somewhat tangentially to that, more about Sontag specifically, is that she was obviously, you know, the caliber of intellectual that doesn't particularly exist off the dome in these times. And while this question really is a bit of a, you know, tangent, um, I'm curious as to what you think, as to whether or not Sontag could really thrive in the same way in this day and age. There's a lot of talk as to social media advocacy and, you know, people spreading opinions and, you know, not yes. literally particularly, but, you know. So I suppose my question is, do you reckon that an intellectual like Sontag is a dying breed and can exist in the same way today? Well, a lot of what's made Sontag so remarkable was that she was a woman. Yeah. I mean, this is something that's really hard to describe because one of the great things about writing about Sontag or about writing biographies in general is you see how much you think you know what a woman is because obviously a woman, you know, actually though, like if you think about transgender stuff that's happened in the last few years, like you realize like even the biological definition of a woman has been changing. But yeah. you know, what was a woman in society? What was a woman in the family? What was a woman in the institution like a university and a newspaper and a, you know, all these different relationships have all changed radically. And um, to have a woman who's as beautiful and as brilliant as Sontag in the 50s and 60s was stunning in America. So I think that's all, you know, that wouldn't be so remarkable today. I keep thinking everybody needs to stop writing columns. Right. You know, because everybody says we all have to get off of Twitter, which I've done, and which is definitely like I recommend it. Um, yeah. But, you know, the kind of intellectual that Sontag is, and I say is because she's still very much with us, I think. She's not writing a column in the Wall Street Journal, you know, saying like, maybe Robert Mueller is going to fire a lot of a brief yeah. on Tuesday, or maybe he's not, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. I think, I think, I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for myself. I think I'm not just speaking for myself. We're all so nauseated by that. Right. Like all these opinions kind of coming at us and all these people telling you this and that, and nobody has any idea about anything. And yet you're still sort of forced to listen to their opinions. And I think the thing about Sontag that's so inspiring and so, um, like just such an inspiration and, and such a model, I think, is that she's not trying to file her piece at 5 p.m. You know, yeah. she's trying to actually help you step back and not be on Twitter and not be looking at your phone. Like she's trying to tell you how to think about what's really going on besides all the noise and the static. So I think that's something that, um, I do think those people exist, but I think that the pressure, I mean, I feel that pressure. Um, I've always resisted it. But you know, the pressure of three things a week around giving my opinion about everything is really boring. And it's actually like, everybody should shut up and actually like go to the library and figure <laughs> out what you're like, you know, read some, read the Decameron and then you can have an opinion. Like, but <laughs> there's too many opinions. People should shut up. Yeah, I have to agree. <laughs> yeah. um, so you've obviously spent a lot of time researching these women and getting to know their families and you probably almost feel like you know them um, even though you've never met them while they were alive. Um, if you could ask both of the women who you who you have written biographies about one question, what would that question be? Um, wow, that's tough actually. Well, maybe it would be the same question actually. Like maybe I would say, assuming that these ghosts, you know, have read my books, um, I would sort of want them to, I would, I would want to know if they felt that I was, that they were well represented in my work. Like if they recognized themselves, if they thought that I um, did a good job. Um, one of the things that's fascinating about Sontag in, on photography, which is a great book that, um, that I can never recommend enough, is that the portrait of the person is always different from the actual person. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know this from looking at pictures of ourselves that like, you know, there are good pictures and there are bad pictures. And we like to think that we always look like the good pictures. And that's why we delete all the bad pictures, you know. But, um, 
but you know that like a portrait of somebody can really distort somebody. They can make you look ugly. They can make you look mean. They can make you look fat. They can make you look stupid. They can make you look all kinds of things, just kind of depending on where you hold the camera, just like half a centimeter. So actually like writing a biography is a portrait of someone. And um, I would like them to feel that my portraits were um, flattering and respectful and, and, and achieved what I wanted to achieve, which is kind of inspire people to keep their work alive. Because part of what we're talking about the Twitter world that we live in is so much stuff comes at you that somebody who died a few years ago can be totally forgotten. Just completely as if they never existed. Mm -hmm. So I try to, I try to not let that happen. I suppose it, it serves as an important testament to all this great work which has happened. Um, I mean, aside from obviously reading Sontag, which I'm still yet to get around to doing, but it will happen this summer. Um, I suppose a question really to, you know, obviously we've tailored the Cameron project towards young writers. And, you know, a big thing, especially over a stretch, you know, long period of time like the summer is how to maintain motivation, say into one work or even into many. Um, and I know you spent something like seven years on your Sontag biography. So I suppose the first part of my question is how do you maintain, you know, such commitment and dedication to just one single piece of work? And the second part of the question, which I suppose is more technical, is how do you distill all of your research and years and hundreds of conversations into, you know, a book which is just 700 pages? Well, so how, the first part is how do you maintain your motivation? Um, like anything that lasts a long time, you know, it goes up and down. But I think that the real answer, and especially if you're, you know, if we're talking to younger people who are interested in writing, you have to choose something you really, really, really fucking care about. Yeah. Because if you don't, there's no way you can keep it up for seven years. It's just too grinding. Like, mm -hmm. and a lot of people do, I mean, I think especially young writers, we're living in a bad economy. We're living in a bad, you know, there's ever narrower space for, for books and for thinking and for writing. Um, a mistake I've seen a lot of young writers make is, they find some subject that they think is maybe really commercial or like really it's going to be this big deal, something. Yeah. They don't really care about it that much, but it seems like a good opportunity for their professional career. And those people get eaten alive, you know, because it's like, it's just too, I mean, you don't have to do every book doesn't last seven years, but like you really, you have to really care about it. And so I was lucky to have two subjects that were just fabulous and that, that kept me interested. And then, um, what was the second part of the question? I mean, it was about after all these years, how do you finally get it down to, I mean, I'm sure we've all had issues with, you know, editing oh. things, making them concise, but I mean, that volume of information into such a small and such an excellent book, it's, um, it's really striking. How, how on earth do you manage to do it for both cases? Well, so this is like some of the, one of those like Oprah moments of depth that is not that deep. You just yeah. have to be really, really organized. Okay. Like for this, because the information is unbelievable and you can get lost in it really quickly. Um, I mean, I interviewed 573 people for this book. So that means, and some of those people I talked to a hundred times yeah. because I said, you know, you, it's a relationship with like Susan's sister and I used to talk all the time. Like she would call me all the time and, she, and a lot of people would. Um, some people you talk to for 10 minutes, but it, it can be totally overwhelming. And I think what happens is, you have to have a very strong sense of yourself and what you want to convey. Because first of all, I leave out a lot of other people's words when I write, like I, you can go into the bibliography and like, especially when you're taught like in high school and college, you know, you always have to quote and footnote and everything, yeah. which I do of course, but it gives you a tendency to not really own your own thoughts about things. Because it's you can kind of weasel out of it by saying, well, Alex says this and Wardy says that. And then you don't have to actually have your own opinion. Yeah. I tried to keep to my own opinion because I feel like if they want to read your book, they'll read your book. If they want to read my book, they read my book. So I want my opinion to be, there's plenty of other books about Sontag, for example. Um, but you know, it's a battle. I mean, and it's really sad. I mean, I have to say like this computer, like it's so funny, like you I'm, you see me, but I see my computer. Um, right. On this thing here, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of unpublished 
pages about Sontag. Yeah. Thousands. I mean, I could write like five books out of the shit that's on this computer. It's embarrassing, you know? It's not <laughs> like, embarrassing. I mean. Well, it feels wasteful, you know? It feels like you harvested, harvested this entire orchard and you ate that one cherry, you know? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's a long book, but I always feel like it could be so much longer. Fair enough. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so going along the lines of, you said staying organized and finding something that you're really passionate about and you talked about how many people you interviewed. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us and everybody listening a little bit about what the process of writing a biography looks like. Like, do you have a specific way that you do it? You start with interviews or something or is it all just kind of random? What does that look like for you when you wrote both of your biographies? Well, so the first one, I actually went to Brazil um, on the spur of the moment, and I just started buying the books about her. You know, I bought her books, and there's a lot of critical books, and there's a lot of, and I, I just kind of started by figuring out the lay of the land. And then I got into the archives, you know, then I started reading all that stuff, and then I got into the archives, and then I started doing the interviews. This time, I kind of started with the interviews. Um, and simultaneously reading her work so that I could sort of start understanding what the themes were. So if you look at my book of the 5,000 themes that you could take on with Sontag, a lot of it is, it's about the relationship between metaphor and reality. So, or the relationship between photograph and, 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 and you know, image and person and, and yeah. word and object and all that kind of thing. Um, I'm really interested in the history of her sexuality, of sexuality in general, but her sexuality in particular. Um, I'm interested in how intellectuals responded to uh, American politics. I'm interested in the evolution of women and feminism. So, you know, I mean, that's already massive subjects right there. Yeah. Fortunately, and fortunately, Sontag has like a hundred more subjects like that that you can also take on. But I think that, um, that's a really big part of my process and it sort of answers a little bit about your question about organization and stuff is that you you realize okay i'm not like i made a decision and i've been criticized for this but you know that's another day at the office um i don't write that much about her films right for example and the reason was i mean not her films i do write about her films but not about the, the her relation to cinema in general which is a really big topic um it's in there a little bit but it just, for some reason, it didn't fit. Like, so when I was writing, there just wasn't room for it. And I could give you a hundred other examples of things that were really interesting and important, but they just, for some reason, don't fit. And you want people to read the book, you know? You, I mean, it's still 800 pages, but it's, yeah. like, I could have done eight volumes, like they did in the 19th century, you know, like the life of George Washington. <laughs> like, yeah. it would take up this much space on the shelf but like, that's just not how people read. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, I want to read it and be interested. And maybe I can give enough little hints of the stuff that I don't put in that they can look in the bibliography if they want to read more, they can. Yeah, mm -hmm. fair enough. Well, you took, you took there, or you touched on something which has actually been a big theme of what a lot of people that submitted to the Cameron Project, which by the way, everyone in the audience, please do. Um, you know, a big theme that's really touched upon in most writing is, is that of identity. And, you know, Sontag obviously had this really discussed, you know, discussed as in talked about, not discussed as in disgusting. Um, you know, she had this really, she had this really famous, you know, she was a lesbian, or I assume she was a lesbian, maybe as the biography of opinion. Um, but she never came out and publicly said so, right? right? Which she's been criticized for now, looking back retro retrospectively, which perhaps is the most fair thing. Um, I suppose a more general question to, re I mean, to you and relating to Sontag and everyone who writes is how much of your own identity really you're obliged to pour into your work to make it unique and opinionated and how much of it like Sontag did, you know, especially with her sexuality, you can leave out and still, you know, maintain a work which is genuine and unique, um, but which isn't perhaps, you know, an open door to, you know, the depths of your soul, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, there's a lot to say about that. Um... Sontag really, she didn't like a lot of what we now think of as identity politics. I mean, she came from a family where there's a great moment where she says, where her mother says, you started the last three sentences with I. Um, and you can hear, I mean, I can hear like my grandmother saying that. 
Like it's rude to talk about yourself that much. You know, you should talk about other people, ask them questions. Don't just sit there and talk about yourself the whole time. So she, didn't, and that was very much of her generation um, in, in one sense. And in another sense, you don't always have to talk about yourself. You know, in illness's metaphor, she does not say that she had breast cancer as she was writing that book. I mean, she was in chemo and she was doing it. But everybody knew, I mean, everybody who read the book felt her personal involvement with it without her having to emphasize it. Um, the thing about her sexuality becomes very complicated and it's a hard thing to explain. Um, but I guess I could say maybe about myself writing about it. So I don't like to, I don't like people to put identity labels on me. Right. Um, I mean, I think that's really, it's easy. It's, it's reductionist and it's quite scary when people do that to you. It, nobody really likes that. Yeah. Um, at the same time, like I'm gay and I'm American, for example. Right. Um, so my, my book is different from if somebody, if from someone who was heterosexual and German. Yeah. But I don't feel reduced by that. I just feel like that is who I, where I'm coming from. And so that's fine. So people can take it or leave it. She was not even willing to do that. And it is sort of her generation, but a lot of people of her generation did, of course, come out of the closet, um, often at great cost, because I think it's really important to remember how courageous that was. You know, now it's um, like everybody's gay or trans or whatever, but that was definitely not the case um, in her generation. Fair enough. So. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. So I am wondering, what advice, because this is the Decameron Project is a um, organization for young people to get involved in writing and to share their work. Um, so what advice do you have to young people who want to be writers or more specifically young people who want to be biographers? Like if you could go back and ask or tell yourself a bit of advice that you think would be really useful when you were first getting into writing and biography, what would that be? Well, okay, so first I'll talk about writing in general. Um, I think the main thing that all writers do is read a lot. And I think that you should resist the pull of novelty. This is something that I've really been insisting on and I've seen it more. I mean, learn Greek, learn Latin, read Shakespeare, do all this kind of stuff. Like all the new stuff that's always coming at you is gonna be there. Right. If it's worth, you know, if it's worth, worrying about, you can worry about it in five years. Um, but there's no substitute for the canon. You know, the canon was very unfashionable for a long time. I think probably people now forgot it even ever existed in the first place. But um, educate yourself through books. Read as much as you can, because any kind of writing is in a tradition. So it's fun to like the Decameron Project, you know, it's every book, books come out of other books. Biography come out of other books. I mean, literary biographies come out of the fact that you're, you know, studying a body of work and you're then kind of chewing it up and, and reshaping it in order to contextualize it in a different way. But, um, I mean, for biographers, like, it's all the same. First of all, writing is all the same. So whether you're writing poetry or biography or fiction or whatever, it's all the same thing. Like, there's this kind of desire to cut it up into little pieces. But it's not, I mean, that's, don't worry about that. Um, it's all the same process for people. Um, and so I would say be really organized if you're a biographer. Um, you can't over organize yourself because otherwise the information will actually just kill you. And that's one. And then the second thing is, um, what was the second thing I was gonna say about that? Oh yeah, well, it's kind of what I was saying. Keep to your own voice. Um, don't, I think what undermines a lot of academic writing is that they want to quote everybody. You know, you want everybody to, um, every scholar at the University of Tennessee has to be quoted somewhere, you know. And, but again, like, be true to your own voice and your own um, sense of things. And then if people want to read other books by other authors, they will. Mm -hmm. Don't junk it up, you know? Yeah. 
Um, well, um, I suppose a, a question which, I mean, relates now back to Sontag specifically, mm -hmm. is the fact that she not only was, you know, we talk a lot about the activist power of literature in, in all of our interviews, and indeed it's really, you know, there'd be no purpose of doing the project if we didn't think that it could have an impact, um, you know, even in a small sense to a small community. Um, but Sontag was very different in that sense. She traveled to Sarajevo, she was there, you know, during the Bosnian War. I suppose my question is, having studied these great intellectual writers, mm -hmm. do you feel as if, you know, it's enough to make a tangible impact in the world through your writing? Or if that has to be supported in some sense by, you know, a Sontag guest, you know, traveling and bearing witness is a very common theme, you know, things like that, getting, getting out there, so to speak. Well, you know, when I said about like people get upset about, you said their mother was wearing a floral dress in 1956 and yeah. you think, why are they so upset about this? One of the things that as a young writer, especially people will tell you is that nobody cares. You're not going to make a big difference. It's really a hard job. Okay. I mean, all that is true. The thing is like people really care about books. They yeah. really do. And don't ever let people tell you that they don't because they're lying. I mean, people really, really care about books. And it's not that every single person who writes is super famous or super influential or anything like that. Um, but books have a power that isn't always obvious. And, you know, again, talking about like everybody should stop writing columns, um, that stuff, um, if you write something that is designed and this is true um in magazines i'm sure actually i don't know if you, you haven't actually had these kind of jobs yet which you will have if you pursue this path and you know eventually get to earn seventeen thousand dollars a year you know doing somebody's dry cleaning and publishing or magazines or newspapers or whatever and then get fired but what what you see is they have these computer things that track the website of how much has been interacted with yeah. So like if they put up a piece, they can see how many people came from Twitter, how many people came from Facebook, how many people retweeted, how many people read 30%, how many people read 40%. How many, I mean, it's just insane. Like it would yeah. actually, if you knew this about your own work, you would just kill yourself. The average time that they expect a piece to be, um, you know, alive on the internet is six hours. Right. Wow. Okay. So it's horrifying. <laughs> So I think the thing is, you want to not write for the six hour time frame. You know, I think that if you take your time, I mean, the books take a long time. So this took seven years. Um, if you take the time and you make something, the impact will be a lot bigger than you expect. And do you actually have to get your, you know, blown up in, 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 in Iraq or whatever? Um, no, I mean, I don't do things like that. Um, I have, I have done my sorts of activism in my life, especially with animal rights and, and certain things that I really care about. But I also, like, it's interesting that people care about what you think because you're a writer. Yeah. So even though you can say something completely idiotic, people think, wow, the guy with the Pulitzer Prize says something really interesting. And you're like, no, that was really stupid what I just said. Like, people, like, have some self-respect, you know, <laughs> like, think for yourself, but, like, there is sort of an aura around the writer, and there is a kind of um, thing that makes it, that makes your words important, and I think one of the real lessons from Sontag, and what's something I've always sort of instinctively thought, is that you should never, ever, ever prostitute your opinion, you know, you should never loan yourself out, you should never devalue words, never devalue writing or books, realize that it has a lot of impact that you don't know that it's having, um, including like after you're dead. In the case of Sontag and, and Clarice both, you know, um, those, so it's, you have to take it very, very seriously. I think that's something that, um, it's kind of embarrassing to take yourself seriously, isn't it? It's a little bit. It's been intimidating. Especially yeah. if you're British, right? I mean, yeah, if you're British, you have it, you really have it hard in that sense, because everyone thinks you're, you know. Well, I mean, it's a whole education of Britain is to sort of ironic and, and deprecation and all that. I mean, right. And, 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 and yet you find that the great writers all take themselves extremely seriously. And this is often um, used against them. I mean, it was definitely used against Sontag. But um, she said, there's enough people wanting to not take me seriously that if I did that too, 
<laughs> there'd be nothing left over. So, um, so activism can take all these different forms. And um, it's something I believe in. I always um, try to speak up and I also try to not speak up about stupid stuff. Yeah. Um, as people do. Fair that enough. devalues it. Um, I guess just, um, I know we're going to try and cram as much in as we pot can possibly before audience questions. By the way, to all those listening, do begin to type those in the Q&A function. We're going to be tending towards that in about five or so minutes. Um, I guess the question, I mean, really the central question, you know, for a biographer of, you know, characters so larger than life, you know, like Clarice and like Sontag, is, you know, do you feel it's possible to sum up someone's story, especially if someone who, you know, quite by opposite to the six hour intellectuals are, you know, really out there and whose work really do stand the test of time? Do you really feel it's possible, you know, A, to separate the facade from the person, which is something which I know is a huge theme in the Sontag book, but also just to present a comprehensive picture, you know, from a third person stance, or in some sense, are those gods of intellect, you know, not quite knowable in, in, in a certain way? Well, you're not trying to present 100%, you know, so that comes back to like all the stuff on my computer that's not in my book. Right. You're not trying to do everything because you can't. And also one risk that I would say also is interesting, don't do a chronology. You know, there's a difference between a chronology of like a Tuesday at 10.15, she ate a chicken sandwich. You know, that's not what anybody cares about. Um, I think that you're not trying to exhaust the subject. You're just trying to present one image of somebody. And the thing about a book, like a biography that's long and complex and has a lot of different sides to it, is that you can actually get a lot in there. But if you try to get everything in there, I mean, it's unreadable. Yeah. Then you've defeated the purpose because nobody reads it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think that's, um, that's a good point, is that you have to really kind of narrow down to what is necessary and relevant. And you talked about this a bit earlier, but I was wondering if we could kind of circle back to this before we move on to the Q&A, is how do you um, pick out those parts that are relevant for what you want to write about, apart from somebody else who might want to write about different things about both of these women? Well, so this is what I'm saying about following your own instincts and your own interests. You know, don't write about it just because somebody else, you know, and a lot of times you think, oh no, somebody on Twitter is going to cancel me if I like don't write enough about cinema or whatever. I mean, people do that. Um, I think you have to really focus on what you're interested in. And I think that what I found is that like with Clarice, the first book I did, I thought if I'm interested enough in her, everybody else is going to be interested in her too because she's really interesting and mm -hmm. all I'm going to have to do is show it. And then I didn't write about everything. I mean, that book actually isn't as long as this one. I mean, she died much younger than Susan did, but, um, but that was something that I just did because I focused on what I cared about in that book. So part of my family are Jewish refugees from Germany and her family came to refugees from Ukraine to Brazil. So I was really interested in that experience of uh, refugees. And um, so I put a lot of that in there. And as it turned out, a lot of people didn't know that just because of the way her story had been told. And a lot of people were really interested in that. So that was just my own experience. I'm very interested in the history of gay activism and, um, and gay, of the evolution of, of, of how gay people are thought of and written about and looked at, which is right. a story that I think, um, I mean, for people of your generation, it's already totally different from in my generation. In my generation, it was pretty okay, actually. Um, but, you know, it's something that's evolved so quickly. So I wanted to kind of take a step back and, and talk about that and maybe convey the depth and the drama of that change. But, you know, I mean, there could have been so many other choices. Um, and you just choose, like, what do you care about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think with that, we'll transition it. We've got about roughly 20 minutes left, although we can adjust the amount of okay, questions. Okay, sure. We'll transition it into the Q&A. So starting right off, Artemis asks, Sontag, Lispector, both are seminal female authors. In your study of their lives, what were the greatest challenges that their gender possessed? As a young female author, do you have any advice for how to overcome such challenges? Um... That's a great question. I mean, first of all, I thought it was going to be more of a big deal that I was a man writing about a woman. So one thing that you learn about the history of biography and the history of feminism is that 
the biography of a female who is not a, you know, married to somebody more important, you know, like some, a queen or a first lady or those kind of women, it's extremely recent. I mean, it's only about 50 years old that, um, that women writers and, and women artists and, you know, were written about in their own right and not as an appendant to a, to a man. Yeah. So it's kind of new. And, and one of the great things about this is that, I mean, I was, I was fascinated by the world of great female intellectuals. And I thought when I was doing the first one, there's so much that's not being said here. Yeah. There's so much that's not being done. You know, we kind of think it's almost already done. Um, but I think that the greatest challenge that it poses um, is taking yourself back emotionally and intellectually to what it meant to be a woman in these times. Because, you know, you think it's so funny to see feminism now or like Black Lives Matter happening now and these kind of things that are actually, um, I mean, I'm not saying it's not bad that the police are killing black people all the time. Of course, that, that's horrible. And our, it's shocking. However, I think one thing that you forget if you don't know the history is that actually there has been a lot of positive change. I mean, I think with Trump, you know, it seems like a bit of a wheels just fallen off completely. It's all just terrible. And it's always been terrible. You know, history goes up and down all of these things. And so I think that you have to kind of think yourself back into like, what was it like being a woman in 1960? I mean, you know, I think about my mother who I remember asking her why she changed her name when she got married. Right. And my mother was an educated woman from Dallas, Texas. You know, she wasn't from a village in Romania or something. You know, I mean, she was a yeah. modern lady. And at yeah. the time, she considered herself a feminist. And she said, well, I didn't even know you didn't have to. Like, it didn't even occur to her to keep her name. It's just, she didn't even, that, she'd never heard of that. And this wasn't that long ago. Um, and you have to think back. I, I just had this, this story of this woman banker in New York who died. Um, and she started a bank for women in the 70s because women weren't actually allowed to get a credit card or a checking account without their husband's permission. So, I mean, this is in my lifetime, you know, I'm not that old. Um, it's, it's amazing. Like, I didn't know these things. So I think like trying to, trying to contextualize is really, it's also fun. It's kind of, I mean, you just learn a lot that you didn't really, wouldn't have ever thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we've got a, another question from the pre-registration for this event. Uh, somebody asked anonymously, what inspired you to write a biography on Susan Sontag? And what was the most interesting thing about her that you found during the research process? Um, so what inspired me, I think I've addressed that a little bit. You know, I, I, this world of, of the great female intellectuals I thought was just something that was both totally interesting and so really shocking. You know, don't underestimate how crazy it is. You know, it's really like you, you get stuff that you just, ugh, you can't imagine. Um, it, it's also sort of dangerous to get into that. Um, but what was the second part of the question? Have, um, it's what was the most interesting thing about her that you found during the research process? Well, so I went to college, I went to high school, I have a PhD, I have all these things that I've done in my life. And Susan Sontag is the most interesting person ever. I mean, everything about her is totally interesting. And if you just read through her work and then you read through the work that she's writing about and referring to, um, she is just a thrilling, fascinating person that educates you about every aspect of culture and every aspect of what's behind culture. And one little thing I should tell everybody, I wish I had a link or something, I could send it, but if you put Susan Sontag top 50 films in the New Yorker, um, there's a list of her favorite films Mm -hmm. And so that's just one little example. Like I watched all these 50 films and some of them were like watching paint dry. They were so bizarre and weird and it's like comes from a different time and you have to think like, okay, I just don't get that. Some of them were these most, in, I mean, just unbelievable films that I never ever in my life would have ever heard of. Um, and it was really fun for a couple of months. Like every night I just watched a DVD of some weird like Ukrainian, poetry 
you know, I mean, you know, just it was the weirdest stuff because she knew everything. She knew everybody. She'd seen. Oh wait, here you go. You yeah. found it, Alex. Cool. Um, can everybody see that? Uh, it's a link, so they won't be able to see images. But that's a. Link. Oh, but you can see the link. Yeah. yeah link. Uh, I mean, quarantine is all about watching the top fifty films. I would say um, it's a great thing to do. It's really fun. So I mean, every, she gives you. I think now that I'm in isolation, like all of us, sort of um, unable to travel and unable to go anywhere, I feel really grateful for the world worldliness of her, for her interest in, I mean, she's interested in everything, like her obsession with food, her obsession with sex, her obsession with traveling, her obsession with books and antiques and crap she bought and like weird vases and all that. Like, I really miss that because all that stuff has such energy to it that you can, you know, you miss it if you're not seeing people and you're not out in the world. I feel like that's something I never really fully appreciated until now. Mm -hmm. um, so she's like the ideal companion for quarantine, I would say. Fair enough. That's awesome. uh, another one of the audience questions comes from Anonymous. Uh, Anonymous asks, did you ever consider a career other than being a writer? Or did you always know that, that was your calling? Um, yeah. Um, no, I sort of, <laughs> I kind of had to be a writer. I mean, I don't think I always knew it was a, my calling, but it's, life does close things off, you know, and then it opens other things. So I guess, you know, if you're in high school now, I mean, even something like you're going to get in, say you're considering three colleges. So maybe two of them aren't going to let you in and one is. So that's where you're going to go. And then that's going to shape your life in a different way than if you'd gone somewhere else. And then when you get out of school, if you try to get a job in one place and I don't want you, and then you get a job somewhere else, you might not have thought of and you end up. So, I mean, I think life had a way of making me be a writer that I just, um, because I kind of wasn't that good at other stuff. You know, I didn't really, like I'm not that practical a person. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't want to work in an office. Now there are no offices, but there used to be until a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, I just sort of, it's, it kind of happened, you know, but, but because I feel it had to happen. I don't know how to explain that, but it, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. Um, and that's a cool answer. Uh, we've got another question from Marianne in the Q and A. Uh, Marianne asks, "What great biographies inspire you, and which ones would you recommend?" Well, so there's two books. I actually just got answered asked this question today, um, but it was about it was a foreigner who has moved to the United States, and he said, "Like, what are the biographies I should read to understand America?" So I'll just throw those out. Um, if I type them in the chat, can everybody see it? Sure. Yes. Uh, maybe it's maybe just it. easier. So um, the first one, this is a great book. It's called No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. Oh, so Fawn yeah. Brody was a woman. Get it? No Man Knows My History. It's a biography of Joseph Smith. Are there any um, Mormons around in our thing? Anyone from Utah? Um, so, oh, I sent that to Alex instead of sending it to oh, everybody. I one. Yeah, I got it. Um, but that's a book about Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, written by a woman Mormon historian in the 40s or 50s. And it's about how the Mormons became a people. And they were chased because everybody hated them. They were chased out of New York and then they were chased out of Ohio and then they were chased out of Illinois. And then finally they end up in Utah. Um, it's a great epic of the West and it's an incredible um, kind of opera and it's just so fabulously well written. And then the others are, um, I mean, I'll put this here. Um, this is sort of like a low hanging fruit, but Robert Cairo is, biography of Lyndon Johnson in now four, um, actually called The Years of Lyndon Johnson, um, which is incredibly fabulous. If people have not read it, um, it's something that teaches you um, how power works in America. So those are just two books that I um, recommended for people to kind of understand what America is and what the westward expansion was and what the settlement of um, the west was and the consequences that, that had on 
the nation and the world. But there's so many good biographies. I mean, there are just, another one that's really great if you wanna be a biographer, in order to make you not be a biographer, it's called um, Keepers, here we go. Um, Ian Hamilton was a British biographer and poet who um, wrote this book about literary estates from Shakespeare to, I think, Sylvia Plath, and um, about how biographies get written. It is hilarious. I mean, he's a brilliant writer, and Hamilton had actually written a biography of J.D. Salinger that was censored by Salinger, and actually went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and was killed. Um, so he knows what he's talking about. That'll sort of freak you out if you're a biographer or you know, aspiring biographer. Yeah. Um, I suppose we'll just jump right into the next one. We'll try and rattle through as many as we can before sure. um, before five. Or I know uh, you're in from Paris, actually. So I think eleven your time. Thanks for coming in. Eleven. Time. I'm, I'm uh, up. <laughs> Anonymous asks. Uh, would you say that there are limits to the realm of biographical literature in the sense that there are identity barriers in so much that it would be a disservice to that person to discuss it as an intermediary? To discuss what as an intermediary? Um, I suppose this perhaps is my interpretation of the question, but because people are often so defined by their identities, is, it, is there a certain limit to what you can know and discuss about someone having not walked in their boots in that way? Um, well, you can't walk in their boots because yeah. you're not them, you know, so that is pretty much everybody in a way. Yeah. And I think that if you have certain experiences, so, I mean, Sontag is American, I'm American, for example. Um, you know, Clarice Lispector is Brazilian and I'm not Brazilian. So I, they're both women, I'm not a woman. Um, you know, they're both Jewish, I'm Jewish. So that kind of counts a little bit. Um, but you know, you, I think it's the concept of identity as being reduced to these labels that we're talking about, you know, gay or straight or, or you know, what nationality or what religion or what, I think we all know that we all have those things, some of us more than others or some of us different ones, but everybody has those things and none of us like to be reduced to them. Yeah. And you only kind of use them to the extent that they illuminate something interesting. Like you have an Iranian father, so that's different from having a French father. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's like the only thing that's interesting about you. You know, it means that that's just one thing that you describe. Um, yeah, and you try to learn as much about it. I, I think the, bio, you know, the, the basis of all this writing, of any writing, is empathy. You know, you have to force yourself to think. With Sontag, it's very hard because Sontag can be quite a monster. You know, she's a very difficult person. I happen to sort of like those kind of women. Like, I kind of... I don't know. They don't really bother me. Um, but some people are like, you know, get really upset that she could be so awful. And I don't really, I don't really judge it. You know, I think, well, you know, she was probably having a bad day. Right. Mm -hmm. to everybody. Um, okay. So the next question we have from our Q and A is from uh, someone in the audience named Maya Glazer. And they ask, you spoke a little bit about not being able to tell every side of the story in one book. I've read your Lyspector biography, which I loved, but I've also read some reviews of your Sontag book. Some say that your claim that Sontag actually wrote Philip Reif's book on Freud is baseless. How would you respond to such criticism and do you think it's justified? Well, okay, so that's a great, so Sontag, just to give you the story here that she's referring to, um, Sontag was married very briefly when she was 17, she got married to her professor. Yeah. Um, and she had a child and, uh, you know, she started writing his stuff. This is, you know, this is not controversial. I mean, there's a lot of documents of her talking about this and writing stuff. And then she left him, went to Europe, and then she comes back um, and there's this very ugly divorce. Um, I'm, I'm really reducing this to a lot of, there's a lot of details here. Well, anyway, it turns out she, according to her, um, and according to her family and friends, she had been writing a book that he later published under his own name called Freud, The Mind of the Moralist, which is actually a great book uh, about Sigmund Freud. And 
for the rest of her life, she felt that she had been robbed of this book. Um, she was very, very, uh, she cared about this deeply until the end of her life, but her husband was threatening her to take away her kid. So at the time she just said, okay, fine. You know, just, and he was a creepy man. Uh, whoa, I spent a lot of time interviewing people about him. Not a lot of, not a lot of love in Philadelphia for this guy. But um, so people have criticized this based on the fact that they don't really think there's a smoking gun about it, except for, I mean, you can analyze this stylistically. You can analyze this based on the letters and the interviews that you do about people who are there and who talked to Susan about this at the time. You know, you can choose to believe her claim or not believe her claim. The fact is often, and this is a really great example of your own conviction and your own voice. You know, this is me talking about this. Yeah. Um, I don't believe everything that Susan says about everything, but I actually do believe her about this. Yeah. Now, like there is not a manuscript where she says that's 100% in her handwriting and that she says, I am the only person that's writing this book. Yeah. But you know, you do your research and then you base your conclusions on what you think. Now, some people don't believe that she was the exclusive author of this. Although almost everybody does say that she, um, I mean, the very minimum that even her husband admitted that she was the co-author. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 50 years later, he admitted that. Um, so some people think co-author means 50%. Some people think it means 60%. You know, yeah. I think she wrote the book because um, I believe her. Fair enough. I suppose a common theme is that when you're writing a biography like this, um, I suppose maybe some of the criticisms are best understood by understanding that it's your voice and your opinion, even though it is ultimately a biography of someone else. Um, I think I'm going to jump to just, I think this might be our final question. So I'm going to try and make it one that counts. It's one of our pre-registered questions. Let me quickly find one. I suppose this one's a nice one to round off. It's very abstract and broad, so I don't expect you to you know, give a full answer. Uh, but it relates to the work that we're doing here at the Cameron Project. And the question's very simple, and it's, how do we use stories to help impact the world in a positive way? Well, this is really a big question. It is a good question to end on. I think that um, we're living in a time where empathy seems to be in very short supply, especially in our public life. Um, in Britain and in America and in Brazil and in a lot of the places that I care about. Um, people are being reduced to something that they're not by metaphor. You know, this is a large question in Sontag's life, but, but you know, the ways that you talk about people, the ways that you tell people stories, and actually um, the ways you show people in a photograph or in a frame, it can actually save people's lives or kill them. Um, you know, you can portray people in such a way that it becomes inevitable that they will have to be killed. I mean, this is the story of fascist propaganda in a lot of countries. So you can portray people's complexities and reduce them to something. Um, by telling people stories, you make that a lot harder to do. You know, if you actually go listen to people and you actually talk to them and you, and you figure out their, their motivations and their, their stories and their background, um, that's the way that you get to understand them. And it's something that is, you know, it's been very devalued because stories now have this connotation almost of fake news. You know, you can kind of make up whatever you want to say about people. And we're increasingly forced to listen to that just because it's out there. You know, um, I mean, Trump is a great one with this. Just anything you, if you say something enough, people will have to believe it. So, you know, you, you have to, you can either let that sit there or you can tell your own story and tell your own um, reality. And this is the thing that's been so revolutionary. I think if you see in Sontag's life, the fact that gay people started speaking in the first person um, and telling their own stories, that women started doing the same thing, that, that black people started doing this. Um, yeah. It made it very hard to demonize people once you actually know who they are. So yeah, it can change the world. Yeah, that's, um, that's a beautiful answer, Ben. A good note, I think, to end on. I can't actually think of a better one. Um, to everyone in the audience, do check out Ben's book, Sontag, I think, Sontag, Your Life and Work, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and as always, if you're inspired in any way by what you've heard here on this interview, do check out thecameronproject.org and read some stories that people like us have got to say. I'd like to thank everyone and, you know, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks a lot.